And so welcome everybody um, to our telehealth session through Healthy Smile, Happy Child. I'm gonna turn it to Daniela to do introductions, please. Welcome everyone to our 21st uh, telehealth presentation for Healthy Smile, Happy Child. It's entitled, Where to Go for Dental Care. Um, it's also our first time using Zoom, so I'm glad that there's a lot of people that decided they would uh, uh, come and see the presentation in that way. So before we start, I usually I do a, a roll call to see who's here, but uh, with, with it being more than telehealth, I think we will just ask that um, you send in your participation <coughs> lists and your feedback forms so that we know who did attend today. And if you want CE credit with the Manitoba Dental Association, just to let us know on your participation list that you do. Uh, and if you haven't received either of those forms, the, the participation list or the um, feedback form, just email me and I will get those out to you. Just a reminder to put yourself on mute well, the presentation's on, and there'll be some time uh, after the presentation for questions. You can either type them in if you're on Zoom, or uh, we will have questions verbally as well. So just to introduce Dr. Bob Schrote, he's the co-lead for Healthy Smile, Happy Child, sure. and the, an associate professor in preventive dental sciences and pediatrics. He's a clinician scientist with the College of Dentistry, and as well, he's the section head of the Pediatric Dentistry for the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. So I will turn it over to Bob, and we can begin. So thanks uh, very much, Danielle, for the introduction, and I also want to acknowledge um, the WRHA Oral Health Program. Um, I currently serve as the chair of our Quality Council, and a lot of this where to go uh, for dental care um, advocacy work has actually come from our uh, Quality Council. Um, we realize the need to uh, inform the public and other clinicians as to where maybe uh, people can uh, access dental care, especially if there's access to care challenges. So Braden's going to um, help me to go to screen share. And we're going to go right there. And double tap that. And perfect. So we're going to go, Braden, how to advance to our next slide, just at the bottom, I guess. OK, perfect. So I uh, want to acknowledge um, Braden and Melina for putting our PowerPoint slides together. A lot of the content comes um, from our Where to Go for Dental Care in Your Community booklet uh, that the oral health program uh, created a few years ago and updated again in, in 2016. As well, thanks to the Healthy Smile, Happy Child initiative. And I do need to acknowledge uh, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research um, for my Embedded Clinician Researcher Salary Award in the area of access to care uh, for at-risk children in Manitoba. So uh, this booklet is available. It's no longer really in print format. There was limited funding to do that, but it's actually uploaded on the WRHA website. Um, so we do have that there. If you do Google WRHA and you go to Programs and you click on Oral Health, and then on the side tab on the far right hand side, there's going to be a little sort of um, uh, listing uh, for where to go for dental care in your community. You can click on that and you get the bigger uh, booklet uh, with the full content in it. So essentially, uh, this booklet and this resource was developed to really help people find dental care uh, that best suits their, um, their needs and financial situations. I know that's probably one of our biggest barriers in accessing care is limited financing. Um, for families. Um, we do recognize that majority of people will just visit a private dental offices. So again, um, that's where uh, uh, dental care is covered either by insurance, whether it be private or uh, government funded insurance, or they're paying out of pocket themselves. Um, and uh, if you are interested uh, in finding out the list of private dentists in your local area, you can look online with the Manitoba Dental Association. They do have a website where you can actually search and their website is quite good because even for instance, if you're looking for a practitioner who speaks a certain language, you can even find that there. You can even query if somebody has is wheelchair accessible um, and whether or not they see different populations. Um, and their phone number is there as well. So as well, you can ask friends 
and uh, families and coworkers if they have in, any information on where to go. I think the majority of those on the call today um, are probably healthcare workers. So you're probably um, looking at you know information to guide your clients and patients and direct them to appropriate dental care. And we'll stop at some point just to take some initial questions. Um, we realize though that there's a, a large portion of the population that really don't have access to care because of limited income. Um, they may have no dental insurance. And so we do want to highlight today that there are a couple of community-based dental clinics in Winnipeg that will provide care um, for those individuals without um, forms of dental insurance. And then the, the piece that I'd want to highlight as well is if you yourself are, have an existing dental home or the patients or clients that you're working with have an ex existing dental home, we're not telling you to now re sort of um, focus and, and, and send them and refer them to other dental providers. We think if people have already made those natural connections, that's an ideal place for them to continue with their dental care. So we encourage uh, people to keep going to their existing dental homes. In complement uh, to this more comprehensive resource, uh, we do have a short, quick reference guide because you know if you've got a 20-page booklet online to see on the WRHA website, or you have a two-pager ideally that you could print off and hand out to your clients and patients, or just have it at the desk when you're counseling or, or you're talking with with your clients or patients about maybe where they could access dental care this is a good resource a quick reference guide that you could laminate and then you can just help and focus and again this is on the wrha website but at the end danielle has been in touch with you so even if you can't find the link just email the healthy smile happy child info email that sent out the meeting information and we can we can send out that link so danielle maybe what we'll do at the end as well we can send out to all, uh, all those on the call today and through telehealth, uh, a PDF of our PowerPoint and the link to the full resource and the quick uh, reference guide so that people don't have to spend time finding it. I think that's a lot uh, more useful. Um, so why is where to go important? So I think the one thing that we need um, to realize is that unlike medical care, dental care is paid for by the patient. It's not part of our government universal health care system. Um, we do have some government programs, though, that do target specific populations. Um, but for the most part, it's either you have private insurance um, or you're paying out of pocket. It's not um, a government insured uh, service. And we know that there's increasing uh, populations um, that face access to care challenges and have barriers to accessing care. And we know specifically in rural and remote regions of the province, um, those who dwell there, um, they're reliant on the dental offices nearby. And unfortunately, um, we'll come to realize, I think, and it's everybody's frustration, is our dental public health safety net is almost really just Winnipeg focused, unfortunately. And I think maybe now with shared health um, being on, uh, being a new entity, there might be an opportunity to discuss the need um, for planning provincially as well. Uh, First Nations and Métis people, we know that there's huge uh, inequities to care there and huge oral health disparities where the burden of dental disease is often, you know, dramatically higher in Indigenous populations. We know our low-income um, families struggle at maintaining good dental health and as well uh, refugees and, and newcomers. So it's nice to see uh, representatives from Bridge Care here. Um, and we do have some good uh, linkages already with some of the community dental uh, programs. So really this resource can help you in working with some of these at-risk populations to maybe um, obtain good access to care. So just a couple of things you know, that are sometimes helpful, especially if you're um, a healthcare worker and you're trying to give advice on one of your clients or patients on accessing dental care, especially maybe if they've never been to the dentist recently or they're a newcomer. Um, so it's really important to have um, ID with, with them when they present. So this way, um, if they do have some form of government insurance, um, somebody uh, at the dental office can call and find out the true eligibility and what that person's entitled for. Uh, medications, very important. Unfortunately, our community-based dental offices, even those within WRHA facilities, we don't interface with the 
um, patient electronic medical records, so we can't tell what medications people are on by logging into our computers, so we're reliant on the patients coming in to disclose to us what medications they're taking. Uh, the amount of a health card's important. Um, it's just as another form of identification. Um, and then to let us know if they've got any dental insurance, whether it be private or government insurance. And that's very helpful because it helps to facilitate um, care. And then there's, it's easier for the receptionist to process and, and get them into the actual dental room. So there are some forms of government dental insurance um, that we just want people to be aware of. So um, most of them cover basic dental care. So exams, cleanings, some fillings and restorative work. Sometimes crown and bridge might be uh, included, but it depends. Um, there's veterans affairs, um, so DVA more commonly known as. Um, those who are receiving provincial um, employment and income assistance, so provincial social assistance and then the non-insured health benefits program, and that's for our registered First Nations and Inuit uh, peoples of Canada. Um, so many of the offices, um, including private practices uh, in Winnipeg and beyond, will see individuals with these forms of government insurance. I know one of the challenges that sometimes dental offices face is uh, depending on the type of government insurance, they may not necessarily pay the same as what the regular dental fees are, but you'll find by calling, um, I would say the majority of dental offices are um, seeing patients with these forms of government insurance. And then there's the interim federal health plan. I know there's some challenges there. Uh, people often are critical that it's not comprehensive enough. I like to sort of think of it though of the mindset because I see a lot of uh, refugee um, individuals, especially children coming, that this is really a stopgap measure that it's something to at least deal with their emergencies as they're coming to Canada um, to do some basic dental work for them and it's a one-year type of uh, insurance and then usually those families will either uh, parents might get employment and get private insurance or some will just um, transition to government employment and income assistance and where they'll have more dental benefits so um, the one year I think is is generally sufficient at least to get people out of pain and to manage uh, their urgent issues so we do have some information here as well. So I think probably some of the um, healthcare workers on um, this uh, Zoom meeting and, and um, telehealth call uh, today probably have all of this information already, but we've got the numbers there. Um, so the eligibility for provincial social assistance or EIA is they must live in Manitoba and be a financial need. I think the challenge here is those benefits tend to end at age 65. So a lot of our aging seniors who have been really struggling financially, the moment they turn 65, I think their EIA dental benefits stop. And then that leaves them in a huge issue. So again, if you do have if you're working with sort of older adults who are approaching the age of 65 and they're on EIA, you might want to have them sort of seek dental care um, and, and have their major issues dealt with before their EIA lapses. Um, the challenge with EIA, there's naturally a waiting period um, for regular treatment. Um, so emergency treatment can be done even while an adult or child is in this waiting period. So they can still go in if they have pain, they can get a tooth extracted or an urgent procedure done. But usually for more sort of routine work for the cleanings, um, for the checkups, for any sort of routine fillings, um, there's a six month waiting period for adults and three months for children. Um, and so often the dental offices will uh, set, submit um, treatment plans to um, the dental program at EIA for review and pre-authorization to ensure that treatment is, uh, is covered so that this way patients don't get an unpleasant surprise and get a, a bill afterwards. Um, Non-insured health benefits, so this is for our registered First Nations peoples and eligible, eligible Inuit. Um, so as well, they'll need to have um, the NIHB number. Uh, one of the challenges here that we typically find is um, children, especially infants, 
Um, at some point, parents need to uh, obtain documentation for their young children, and we're wanting to promote early dental visits. So at times, um, mom might be wanting to come in with a one-year-old um, for that first dental visit, um, but moms haven't always uh, completed the necessary paperwork, so that child has their own number, and that can sometimes delay care and causes some challenges um, with the administration office over in Ottawa. So uh, my advice to healthcare workers, if you're working with uh, women with uh, newborns, maybe see if you can help them apply for um, um, documentation so that their infants get covered. Um, and again, um, there's a predetermination process um, for uh, some procedures, although um, there are many procedures now that um, NIHB has realized there are barriers to care, just the wait time to get your treatment plans approved. So they actually have sort of uh, approved some uh, procedures outright and they don't need pre-approval. DVA again here, there are some um, caps to the program here. Um, and so again, just make sure that uh, when you are sending a client or a patient to a dental office, that they bring along all the necessary documentation that they have. Um, so then that can facilitate things. Um, and then IFH, and then maybe I'll pause for a minute um, before we go any further. Um, interim federal health for refugees, the numbers there, again, this is a one year sort of period uh, from the time that they're, uh, that they're processed and on arriving to Canada. Um, some things are uh, approved, others aren't, and this has been documented before. Um, and then we have a sheet, I believe, for newcomers on the next slide um, that helps people understand. Um, there are some challenges, of course, uh, getting fillings done right away, but the, the advice is, you know, have people use that they're entitled to an exam, getting themselves out of pain, um, but sort of more complex procedures are often sort of put on hold until they transition into um, other uh, forms of insurance. So our students have put together um, with uh, Dr. High Santiago at Manitoba Health and I believe Linda Ferrand at Smile Plus a program in Winnipeg, you know, getting dental services in Manitoba, sort of what's covered, what's not. So this is like a little uh, tip sheet. And Daniela, have we had this added to the WRHA website yet or no? Um, I think they're added. <laughs> Sorry, everything's added. This is added up on the website too? Because th this is this is actually something that should go through the oral health program, but if you if you remind me, we'll get that uploaded too. But maybe if we can send that out as well when we send out all the links and the PDF of the PowerPoint, because I don't want the biggest frustration is you take part in sessions like this and then you're left to find things all on your own. It's just like um, that's even more frustrating. So. Uh, but th these resources let you know sort of what's covered, what's not. Um, and um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there of what's not covered. I know a lot of people um, who criticize IFH, IFH doesn't cover this, this, and this. And I'll say to them, actually, it does. You just didn't read the details uh, very closely. So again, I think part of it is educating your, your clients and patients, educating yourselves as healthcare workers, and then the other thing is educating the dental office staff, because I would bet you that sometimes the dental offices may not fully know all of um, the procedures that are covered and the steps to get approval. And it's been interesting. I've sent in letters on behalf of patients to interim federal health outlining the need for treatment and rationale, and even though things at times are not on paper covered, it's amazing what, if you write a compelling letter and justification, they will sometimes, I won't say all the time, but they will sometimes consider special circumstances and, and help uh, patients out. So that's really good to see. And then uh, private dental insurance. So again, if people have private dental insurance, my advice is they, can, they have no real barrier um, to seek uh, dental care in private offices, except for sometimes some offices expect patients to pay upfront and then wait to get reimbursed. So I know for some families within private insurance, there's still that financial barrier where, you know, you're not going to be able to all the time pay, you know, $1,500 in advance for your crown and then wait for the dental office to process that with the insurance company and then wait another four weeks for your check to arrive by mail. So I would say as you know, 
patients should have those conversations with the dental offices to see if um, the dental office can direct bill uh, the insurance company rather than having the patient prepay. Because I think that we find even with um, some specialty care, you know, some offices, children are covered for the the uh, dental surgery fees, but if the average dental surgery case is about three thousand five hundred dollars, um, some of the specialist offices are actually making the families prepay and then get reimbursed by their private insurance or their government insurance, and that's just not doable for I would say even majority of us uh, in this room or on this call today. Like that's just an outrageous amount. So, um, but so again. People, we encourage you, if you do have private insurance, to seek dental care in the private sector uh, rather than our community-based dental programs, which have often, you know, very specific missions um, and specific populations that they care for. So I'll maybe pause here just and see if there's any questions. So Amanda, I don't know if telehealth has or if anybody on the Zoom call has. Um, I'm going to just um, stop share at this point and see if anybody on the Zoom call has any questions. Okay. It's kind of shocking actually that there's that Manitoba Health does not cover basic dental when it is so connected to health, right? And and, and would actually decrease uh, lots of things, right? I mean, you know, health related visits doctors, ERs and whatnot. Yeah. We had a lot of people in the ER coming in because they had a dental emergency thinking, you know, Absolutely. It's different, they might get admitted and covered and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, so I've got a couple slides later on in the talk and it's perfect to that point because I think right now we, uh, through the oral health program, we ran an audit a couple years ago and I think there's over 1,500 or 1,600 individuals who go to the emergency departments in Winnipeg every year with dental emergencies. Um, and we found out from doing the audit that there's probably a, a third of them who actually leave after sitting there for hours and never get the care um, but it's also then tied up ER resources too because you know an admitting clerk or a nurse um, and physicians have had to deal with with those individuals and then they up and leave and so we also want people to be aware and, and as well the cost right people think that that's insured the moment that the dentist on call comes or the oral surgeon on com call comes to the ER that patient's walking out with a bill and often it's a specialist bill which is more than what the bill would have been had they gone privately so we do want um, the ERs to know and they've been very good um, they I had requests before over the years for our booklets because I think the people who are, are doing the intake often are trying to redirect people with dental emergencies if they can get managed in the community clinics that's where they can go. The other interesting thing that we found doing our audit a few years ago is the number of people presenting for dental emergencies in the ERs tends to increase on Friday nights, Saturdays and Sundays because that's when a lot of private offices are closed but I think we've tried to take that back to the dental association to work with dentists to say you have a responsibility with your patients after hours. It's not the role of the health authority and the emergency departments to deal with your dental emergencies after hours. If you've done an extraction on a Friday afternoon with your patient in your private office, don't be telling that patient, go to the ER if you have problems over the weekend because I'm not reachable. You're supposed to give your cell number and have alternate arrangements made. So this is one of the things that you know we're trying to slowly work with the dental association to get members to realize it's a professional responsibility piece. Good point. Do you know if there's coverage within the EIA system for tooth tooth replacements for dentures? So dentures there are, so it's dependent on the number of missing teeth or where the teeth are missing. So for instance, if an uh, adolescent or young adult had a front missing tooth, the rest of their teeth are healthy, generally they'll get approved for what we call like a little provisional or a flipper partial denture to go and replace that space. Unfortunately, no bridges or implants. Um, and then as well, depending on the number of missing back teeth, people can also be eligible for, for um, uh, partial dentures so that they can chew again and have some aesthetics. Good question. Good. Any other comments uh, from Zoom? Um, if not, feel free to type your questions and then we can go there. I'm going to go back to share screen and carry on. And Braden's going to guide me, let me know if I'm doing okay. I just yeah, to add a I sure. Don't know if it's relevant for anyone to know, but uh, we've had low income people over 65 that 
their income was so low with CPP or pension that they didn't realize they're actually eligible for top up to welfare mm. after 65. So if their income is very low, and I'm talking like, you know, six to 700, it's it's worth them exploring whether they get any top up. Because I've done that's that perfect. for somebody who ended up needing a lot of dental work. Oh, that's good. That's good. And I know uh, Kalita High Santiago, we can maybe send out her contact information as well. She's our provincial oral health consultant over at Manitoba Health. And she, she has some knowledge as well with EIA. And so sometimes, yeah, she's let us know that there are specific funds that you can maybe do a one-time request. I'm not sure how frequently they get approved, but there is that avenue too. I think it's just sort of a, a hidden um, secret. So, yeah. Um, so Access Downtown, um, so this is a university-run dental program through the Center for Community Oral Health, but based out of the WRHA's Access a Downtown location. Um, it's open Monday to Fridays, 8.30 to 4.30. I practice there on um, Fridays, um, but the number's there, and um, there's no restriction by a postal code. I know some of the access centers and some of the primary care programs in Winnipeg often restrict by specific um, postal codes in Winnipeg, uh, but here we don't have a restriction. So um, anybody even out of the city um, could um, apply there and, and see. Um, there's no financial uh, sort of eligibility that you don't have to provide any documentation. Um, and there is though um, at times a considerable weight um, just because there's high demand but they provide general dentistry services so they'll provide most things except for I've put some root canal treatment they they don't necessarily do them routinely but in some circumstances they may do simple root canal treatment um, for individuals but if you're needing a complex molar root canal I would say that's probably uh, not going to happen there. Um, and then what they will do if things are beyond the scope of the general dentist there, uh, patients will get referred out for specialist treatment. So um, they do offer um, a little bit of a fees at a reduced rate. Uh, so if people do have um, some um, financial struggles, um, they will, without providing any sort of documentation, offer 25% reduction um, in um, um, the dental fees. Um, the only issue is lab fees they can't reduce because um, the lab fees come from, from a private lab if someone's getting a crown made or a denture made. So those still the patient would be having to pay the full fee. But uh, we do accept um, individuals with EIA, NIHB, IFH, veterans, private insurance, and then out-of-pocket payment as well. And we do want to put down and we do want to emphasize that we see adults and children and specifically infants and toddlers. I think we just want to emphasize that as, as well, that early dental visits are really important to keep kids on that healthy dental path. And then this way they have less chance of getting dental disease and less, um, um, less severity and sort of lower dental uh, treatment costs later on throughout life. Deer Lodge, um, so this is another uh, uh, dental program that's affiliated with the University of Manitoba through the Center for Community Oral Health. Um, their days fluctuate, so we don't wanna put specific days of the week. Uh, it is roughly about two to three days per week. Um, and they will see not only residents of Deer Lodge, but also patients from the community. Um, can actually uh, visit there and on outpatient basis and have dental care and they function generally 8.30 to 4.30 p.m. Um, their scope as well very similar to Access Downtown General Dentistry uh, so the basics um, really not a lot of complex dental care being done like really not too often are crowns or bridges done dentures I would say are, are done probably pretty commonly there because uh, they tend to see more of the geriatric population or the aging population and then as well if patients need a referral to specialists that happens um, so they will serve individuals living in Deer Lodge in the facility but the community dwelling 
residents, including adults and children, are also welcome. So best to, to call and find out. They have been seeing some of the refugee populations um, over the past couple of years, but I think one of the challenges that they face is they tend to have a higher no-show rate um, for um, seeing some of the refugees, but I think it's the distance because um, it's easier for a lot of the newcomers to access access downtown dental services rather than you know a couple of bus rides um, over to Deer Lodge and I've even heard the you know the horror stories of people thinking oh it's on Portage Avenue and so people have walked from Portage and Maine all the way to Deer Lodge to seek dental care not realizing how far down Portage it is um, so again, they'll see all of the individuals with the different types of government and private insurances, and they'll also see individuals uh, without dental insurance, and um, they have recently as well, I think, um, offered reduced uh, cost as well. I just won't say, I, I, I have a feeling it's very similar to Access Downtown, but don't quote me on that, but I do know that they, if someone says, you know, I need some financial assistance I can't afford, they would be willing to reduce the fees somewhat. Um, as well, it function, this home dental care program, so this is really a service um, for those living in long-term care facilities. So uh, it's more of a special specialized service. So they will visit um, long-term care facilities in, the Winni in Winnipeg. They will, I think, go as far as St. Adolph, I think. Um, and they have a team of dentists, hygienists, dental assistants who will visit. Um, they provide care Monday to Friday. I think they often will visit each personal care home or long-term care facility about once or twice a month. So um, patients or their families or the facility get in touch with the home dental care program, get a person registered, look at a dental assessment treatment plan, and then if they want to go forward with treatment, um, those, um, those are discussed with and um, then each visit, if the patient has, uh, is needing dental work, they'll get their care provided in their, in their facility. So they'll bring in the dental equipment into the facility. So again, if you can imagine, it's a mobile dental program that sets up in the dental, in, in sort of a room in the long-term care facility. They really don't do a lot of complex dental work. So it's real basic and I would say more palliative type of dental care. Um, yes, they'll do some fillings, but they'll also take into consideration, you know, the health status and sort of, um, you know, the individual's uh, need and, and their current situation and, and come up with a realistic treatment plan for them. So this is fee-for-service based. Um, so sometimes there is an institutional house call that um, if it's not covered by insurance, that the resident also has to pay for the service to actually come uh, into the facility. So, uh, all right, and then that just gives you some indication on the types of insurances that are covered. Uh, Mount Carmel Clinic, um, I think probably would also be um, a very handy clinic for maybe some of your clients or patients um, located on Main Street. So actually not too far north of Access Downtown, just a little bit tucked off of Main Street though. Uh, the dental clinic's number is there. Um, we operate Monday, Wednesday and Friday, 9 to 5 p.m. And on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, our clinics go until 8 p.m. I do the two evening clinics there on Tuesdays and Thursdays between 5 and 8 and we know that there's lots of demand um, so we really would just ask you to have any um, patients or clients that you're trying to send there call ahead to determine their eligibility because at Mount Carmel um, the way that their funding mechanism works through United Way our target is really to help the working poor for the dental program and so we're really trying to reach those who truly don't have any dental insurance at all um, so we do basic dental care, um, diagnostic services, preventive care, fillings, extractions, um, really um, no crown or bridge work done, no denture work done. Um, so often we'll connect individuals to other clinics uh, or providers for that. Again, adults and children, we really don't have an age restriction. And again, we're also trying to emphasize infants and toddlers are very much welcome um, because we know that if we wanna keep kids dental or teeth healthy, um, we need to start seeing them early. 
Um, our uh, financial eligibility, I have a slide coming up that actually goes a little bit more into detail about our sliding scale. So um, we look at um, the number of dependents in the home, um, their overall family, net family income to determine if they meet our eligibility and what their uh, nominal payment might be. And they need to have um, a recent Revenue Canada Notice of Assessment. However, if they're a brand new newcomer to Canada as an immigrant, not as a refugee, and they haven't worked in the system, um, we're not going to, if they are of low income and they meet our criteria, we're not going to have them sit and wait for a year until they filed with Revenue Canada. Of course, you know, uh, we would um, we incorporate those individuals into uh, the dental clinic there. So here's just a little slide. Um, so again, um, there's no postal code restriction, but whereas Access Downtown will see uh, individuals living outside of Winnipeg, uh, Mount Carmel, um, the dental program is restricted to those living within Winnipeg. So um, that includes, you know, St. Norbert. I know um, there is some urban sprawl, but sometimes people sort of thought the perimeter was the cutoff. It's just no St. Norbert. There's a city councilor for St. Norbert, and that is part of our program here. Um, so again, if you have some form of dental insurance, whether it be private or public, uh, we encourage you to uh, seek care elsewhere. Um, however, if somebody's going to present to our office with an emergency and they have non-insured health benefits, of course we're going to help them out and then encourage them afterwards to seek dental care uh, and try to connect them with an office in the community. Um, I know the struggle that I hear often is there are some families who are working poor and have limited private dental insurance from um, their employer. Um, so I know this is something that our program needs to talk about more at Mount Carmel because sometimes the family might only get $1,000 a year in for the entire family from some of these um, dental insurance programs and that could get used up just by having everybody in the family go for a dental exam and checkup and cleaning and then how would they even afford the payment for fillings so uh, but if you can sort of see here if if somebody if the net family income is 31,000 and they've got four individuals in the family they uh, for each dental appointment they would pay $30 regardless of the treatment provided so there are some evenings where I'll do you know or $500 worth of care for a child and the family is only paying either the 25 or the $35 and so that's the nice thing that because we're United Way funded and subsidized we're able to to do that um, for individuals. Any questions at this point? Well, maybe Braden just stop share just to see if anybody's typed in a question. Nope, nobody's typed in a question. What about those ones that don't have, uh, haven't done their taxes or not able yes. to show that? Mm -hmm. they have, you know. So we know that there is I'll, the, the emphasis for those tax clinics. So I know Mount Carmel, I believe, is participating in Know Your Benefits. I know um, the poverty tool that's out there um, to have healthcare providers understand that poverty is a huge uh, determinant of health and encouraging people. Yes, yes. So um, we, there are some clinics that are put on, I think, in, in um, um, Point Douglas area to help individuals who haven't filed with Revenue Canada to get um, um, their returns and also then get the proper documentation that they need. So. So yeah, it is, it's a challenge that I think for further discussion with Mount Carmel is, you know, there are some families who just haven't filed um, and there's some barriers there. How do we make sure that we provide them the assistance to complete that part so then they can actually uh, apply and become eligible for our uh, program? Next slide that I'll just go through is Smile Plus. So um, this is a WRHA operated pediatric dental program located uh, within McCray School on Mountain Avenue. And they function Monday to Friday. I know some of them are on the Zoom meeting today. I think Deanne is registered there. I saw her sign in before. Um, so she can always correct me if I misspeak. Um, and uh, so again, um, we can let families know of that program. Um, general dentistry for children, um, basically up to 18 years of age. Um, they'll do diagnostic services, the routine dental care. If they find a child needs to be referred to the specialist, they will uh, try to do that as well. Um, from our last 
update in 2016. Um, they had a sliding scale that might have changed a little bit. Um, again, they will see individuals um, who have uh, other forms of government insurance through employment income assistance, the non-insured health benefits program, and interim federal health. And the nice thing is they really reach out to many of the children actually attending school at McRae. Uh, those children actually benefit because they're, uh, it's very close to home. And the service. Hi, Bob. Hi. Hi, Ingrid. I don't know if you can hear us. Obviously, yes. Yes. So the only change in the population we serve is uh, under 18. Okay, perfect. If you're in 18, then we refer them elsewhere. Thanks. And I don't know if you received our other um, message we sent regarding Mount Carmel. Are they, we were informed they weren't taking any more new patients. Has that changed? Yeah, that's an interesting one, Ingrid. So I haven't formally, I know we had a, in the summertime, there was a hold on accepting new patients. Um, I, that's an issue that I, I hope to, to speak with Jay, our, our um, manager of primary care in the next couple of weeks. And mm -hmm. I probably will see him next week because I think we're at a stage now where we can probably lift that. Like we've just, right. you know, if patients are in need, we haven't, um, I, we ha I haven't myself turned them away, but I know there has been a frustration and I know even Dr. High Santiago at Manitoba Health has had a few complaints where mm -hmm. people have called and been turned away. Um, right. And I think we just need to somehow monitor that and maybe have reception keep track of that um, and sort of what information are we sending out to families. So I'm hoping, you know, it seems to be that some people have the mindset that we have a hold and others it hasn't right. been fully communicated to, to truly the clinicians, so it's interesting. Right, and if we could probably just add maybe, I don't know if we have to tweak this info that we are a teaching facility with dental students, fourth year, and then our pedo residents. Right, so, so definitely. That, you know, yep. Families have an idea that, you know, when they do come, uh, they may see a pedo resident or a fourth year dental student. Um, but you know, we were also informed that you know they'll they are graduating within the next year. Or so just so they realize that we are a teaching facility also, and there's nothing we can do to change that, as we're in partnership with you know the university. Perfect. And Ingrid, thanks so much for emphasizing that because yes, um, I think that's how some of these programs work, especially Access Downtown, right. Deer Lodge, and Smile Plus is they do have, it's a student learning um, placement site. So some of the care is, is done by students and that helps to as well make things a little bit more affordable or allow these programs to offer the services that they do. Now, Carmel will have some students as well. Hygiene, dental hygiene students rotate there on Tuesdays, and occasionally we may get a few dental students during the year. Um, but the the bigger sites, Smile Plus, Access Downtown, house and and host students far more frequently and for longer durations. Thanks so much, Ingrid. Uh, moving on, Saint Amant. So again, this is more for residents of Saint Amant Center. So. Uh, unless you have, and I know there's probably not too many long-term residents there. I think there's probably people who access day programming there. Um, so there is a dental program there that operates about two days per week. And uh, if you know anybody who's um, accessing other services there, um, we can always inquire about the dental program. Um, their scope of uh, services there, the populations that they serve, um, and the financial eligibility. And then our College of Dentistry clinic here at, at the University of Manitoba. Again, um, it's a teaching facility primarily, so um, not everybody is eligible. I think you'll get screened or patients will get screened and see if they're a suitable teaching case. I know, for instance, if you have clients who maybe have high social needs and maybe have uh, some mental health challenges, this may not necessarily be the ideal place to send them because um, chances are it will only in further frustrate your, your patient or your client because um, if you have somebody with you know severe mental health issues, um, this is not always the most comforting clinic to go to. 
it might it might it, it's good and but we hope that they get the students get those experiences on their external rotations at access downtown and right. and mount carmel clinic but i know for instance this clinic you know there there's a lot of you know i think they set some rules that you know if you no show to appointments or fail appointments you know you get blackballed and things like that so um they're a little bit more black and white. Although if you do need specific procedures, for instance, somebody needs maybe a crown or a root canal or a specific type of denture, you know, and you do have the time because, because it's student, um, it's a student sort of operated clinic, the procedures take longer to complete, you know, those are opportunities as well. So there are a lot of seniors and um, those who have left the workforce um, and retired who are now sort of have the time and they seek dental care out there. And they have different services. Again, just to emphasize that they are a teaching environment. Um, and then there is that initial screening to determine if you're eligible. So you could get booked, you could get screened, and you could still get told that you know what, you're not really a suitable teaching case. Um, so um, many of us in the community dental programs don't frequently refer to this program. Um, especially for some of our, our patients, if we sort of know that there's going to be, that patients might face further access to care challenges here. But it, it does serve a need as well. Um, the one piece that I'll mention is most of these WRHA facilities, except for the university-based uh, clinic, also um, we can take advantage of the language line service uh, through the WRHA, especially for our um, refugee and newcomer populations, if uh, language is a barrier. It's uh, unfortunately because it's a University of Manitoba clinic, not part of the WRHA affiliation, um, the interpreters don't come here. Right. If somebody were need to need an interpreter and they're accessing care at the College of Dentistry, they'd have to make their own arrangements. Um, and just like a, as a private office might have to pay for an interpreter, uh, those services then are on a cost recovery basis. Um, children's Dental Clinic, um, a children's hospital. This is primarily a referral based um, program. Again, you know, they do maintain an after hours um, call program, but this is the issue that, that came up earlier in the discussion is just by calling and, and sending your child or sending a child to the emergency room after hours, if they call the pediatric dentist on call, there will be a bill. It's not free. It's not part of the, the health care, um, universal health care. So my advice is, again, is if you have, if your child has a dentist or children that you're dealing with have a dentist, those dental offices are the ones that are supposed to be providing some guidance on after hours emergency dental care and not telling families, oh, just go to the ER and clog the ER. Um, they see a lot of special needs patients here at this clinic. They will see some children from the community, but best to call in advance. I wouldn't necessarily go there as the first stop for accessing uh, dental care for children because they do have a long wait list um, uh, for special needs patients as well for the operating room for children needing um, those um, services under general anesthesia. They have a considerable wait list. Um, so you're probably often, um, if you do have specific needs for children, maybe for general anesthetic, um, sometimes uh, there might be referral to other uh, pediatric dentists uh, might be uh, helpful there. Um, health sciences, adult dentistry. So again, there is a dental clinic in HSC. It's by referral only. Um, again, um, if you have non-urgent uh, adult dental referrals from dental offices, there is a process to follow. There is a website there. And they recently had this appear in their bulletin out to the dentists in Manitoba um, because a lot of times uh, private dentists have been sending patients sort of as at, at, to the adult dental clinic as the dumping ground for patients that they don't want to deal with or their after hours emergencies that they don't want to deal with. And this is not appropriate. Um, for urgent adult dental referrals, there's a direct number, but they do expect a, a proper referral to provide them with information. Um, again, by referral only. Um, um, if, for oral maxillofacial surgery needs as well, there's a number that um, needs uh, to get called. But the, the issue is if you do send someone to these services after hours, um, and even within hours, there 
this is not an insured service, so there's still a fee that the patients will be expected to pay uh, if they don't have insurance. So please be aware of that. So even if they're inpatient, say? Eh? Inpatient as well, unless it's some, some way related to their medical condition, why they're admitted, maybe if it's a head and neck cancer issue and there's a tumor and right. yeah, that those would typically maybe get covered. So they do have some, some specific do's and don'ts, mostly for the dental offices, but I figured I'd share this today as well. Do always notify their service prior to sending someone to their clinic. So warn the patients that the fee is the same. And sometimes it could be higher if it's a specialist seeing you there. Um, treat uh, the service as a specialist um, referral and ask them in advance. So get in contact. So private uh, dentists must always provide patients uh, with their own emergency contact information. So again, um, you know, if your dentist is going out of town and they've just done some work for you, you need to ask them, so what are, what do I do if I have an emergency after hours? They shouldn't be telling you to go to HSC emergency. That's so inappropriate. Um, so don't just tell a patient to show up at HSC. This happens routinely. Um, don't refer a patient because they can't afford treatment to them because their funding model is different. Uh, don't refer a patient because private dentist doesn't take employment income assistance or EIA or what happened over the years is a lot of patients with HIV and Hep C were referred solely for those reasons to their clinic, which a private office should be able to adequately and safely care for patients with Hep C and HIV. Um, tell, don't tell a patient just to go to any hospital and don't ask a patient to make their own referral. Like don't hand out the, their number and expect the patient to, to navigate through. So they're trying to um, curb bad behavior from some dental offices with, with this new messaging. Lastly, just a couple of quick things. So I figured um, good things to know while we've got people on the line. We want to emphasize that the Manitoba Dental Association still has a free first visit program. So people can go to the MDA or call their number um, and find out if which offices are participating and where in the province. And you can actually search their website for finding providers and they'll spit out a list of names. And um, so we really want people to take advantage of that service. So again, if finding Finances are an issue at least you know we can get kids uh, at an early age in for a free assessment so many offices are still participating and the MDA's number is there and so they'll be glad to hear from you um, Pam McFarlane often you know deals with public inquiries on a daily basis and then lastly something that you know is happening um, that maybe provides us another layer of improving access to care is silver diamine fluoride. Some of you may have heard about it over the past few months. It's, it's somewhat newer to Canada. This is a form of secondary prevention where um, a liquid can be painted onto a patient's cavities, uh, especially if we're thinking of medically compromised patients who have, are having trouble accessing you know, specialty services, children currently maybe who might normally need a general anesthetic, but you know parents can't afford, um, or even individuals who can't afford, you know, full treatment. Um, this might be a way to at least stop their cavities from getting bigger, um, paint this on the teeth, and sort of increase our our safety net and our reach, um, and improve some access to care. Um, for some individuals, this um, this successful treatment. Um, you know, if it's some baby teeth, those teeth could, you know, get treated and theoretically allowed to exfoliate or fall out on their own. Um, or at least it could be used to delay treatment till an age where maybe um, the child can sit better in the dental chair rather than needing to go for general anesthetic. But we're even thinking for kids who are currently on wait lists for dental surgery, why, why not offer this to them so at least the severity of their dental problems problems don't get worse so that the cavities don't get bigger and you know you can still maybe eventually fix a tooth instead of eventually having to pull this out so this is also maybe a good product for our aging populations in long-term care facilities um, where uh, maybe families can't afford or maybe it's more compassionate care for individuals who are at end of life but you also want to make sure that their cavities aren't progressing this could be used to arrest the tooth decay and at least um, know that um, there shouldn't be any symptoms or increasing severity going on. 
So I'm going to stop there um, and take some questions. And first of all, thank you all for um, your time today. So Braden, I can just go to stop share. And if there are questions, so uh, so someone just, Kalita just, uh, Dr. Hi Santiago just emailed Mount Carmel uh, Clinic about uh, new patients and was told that not just yet new patients. Um, but hopefully soon is the response. So uh, we are having a team meeting at Mount Carmel very soon with our dental providers and our quality council meets next week for oral health. And so we'll be able to talk uh, with the Mount Carmel representative more next week. Because I think we're at a stage where we, uh, we had a staff member who was on medical leave, but I think we've been able to deal with a lot of the backlog. And I think now that was the main reason why they weren't accepting new patients. Um, all right, any other questions, those on Zoom or those in the room here? I noticed you didn't put silent mission on there, unless I missed it. Yeah, so that, you know, that's my oversight. Apologies for that. Um, they, they do have a clinic as well, the Saul Sarah Health Center. Um, so um, they do offer dental services there. I'm just not too familiar of how frequently they operate. Yeah, and it's uh, kind of random, but they do yeah. have a dentist who do pro bono for their time in there. And usually, you know, it's clients who stay at Sano, but I yeah. think they take some from the area if they come in and they have, you know, dental. That's good to know. Issues. So, yeah, yeah, it'd be worthwhile adding that. So, absolutely. Can you be sharing the uh, PowerPoint? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, okay. yes, yeah, so we definitely appreciate everybody coming today. Um, and comments and feedback are absolutely welcome because without some of this information, you know, how do we share? This is sort of our intent is to really share what we know and learn from you as well and try to advocate and um, navigate for some of our patients and clients. But as you'll see as well, I think our, our big gap is we're very Winnipeg focused and there's not too much happening outside of Winnipeg. I do want to recognize though that there probably are many dent private dental offices who are doing some pro bono work too. They're sort of our unsung heroes that we often forget to thank. Uh, but they're probably on a weekly basis. There are offices probably doing uh, some charitable work for patients as well. So maybe from our bridge care folks today, any comments or feedback? Yeah, um, yeah just to note, we've been uh, experiencing problems with um, navigation. For okay. Our that's that's the big barrier. Um, we have. Uh, and I know the university was thinking of trying to see if they can maybe ask uh, access downtown to maybe start increasing the number of, of refugees that they can see. I know the university has asked because access downtown, the primary care side functions as well on Saturdays and has some extended days. So I know the university Center for Community Oral Health has been sort of looking at what's the financial feasibility of maybe extending hours, maybe doing some Saturdays as well as a way to maybe increase uh, care to some patients and families um, who otherwise are not accessing. I know that one of the struggles is we get referrals to some of our primary care dental sites, but we're not always responding in a timely fashion to the referrals. So that's another discussion I think that the dental folks need to have is, you know, we need a system better to prioritize the referrals, right? What needs to be get responded to urgently and what can maybe wait a couple weeks. I think if you sit on the referrals far too long, by the time you actually reach out to the numbers that are listed, those patients have already moved out of transitional housing into yeah. other housing and you've yeah. lost them, right? That's, that's what we're seeing. And we're so we've uh, reached out to some Fort Richmond so dentists. Thank you. We take IFH, but then there's that interpreter piece and what we'll do is there's a question if they can view this presentation on zoom later i think there may be a mechanism i'll leave that to brayden and daniela to answer but we'll also send a pdf of the powerpoint out um 
because then it won't be a huge file and clog up your uh, inbox or get punted out. And this way you can get copies of the slides. So it is being recorded and it will be a large file. Okay. But people can log on later onto Zoom and watch this after um, from the platform. We'll have to see. Sure, we'll have to, sure yeah, see. Okay. We'll, we'll be in touch. Um, so that's good. Any other questions, comments? I think telehealth, we've yeah. lost them already. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. But if not, uh, thank you very much, um, Daniela. Our yeah. next telehealth session and Zoom meeting, um, what is our next topic? I think we're looking at pediatric dental surgery rates um, as okay. our first one. And, possibly June, um, so, but we, we'll send out more information before that. Perfect. And if you have suggestions for topics that you'd like to see, um, by all means, um, we'll consider them and see if we can pull something together um, to share uh, more and learn together. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'll turn that over to you. I just, I just want to see. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. That's good. Thanks so much. It's, it's rare we have people in the room right now. Yes. <laughs> so it's, it's, nice. it's a nice day. We thought we'd come out. Should I end it? Yeah, it is. Yeah.